The Necrons in the Warhammer 40k universe are a mysterious race of robotic, skeletal warriors that have lain dormant in their stasis tombs for more than 60 million Terran years, and who are the soulless creations and former servants of the ancient Satan, the terrible star gods of the Eldar myth. The Necrons are ancient beyond reckoning, predating even the birth of the Eldar. At long last, however, they are beginning to awaken from their tomb worlds, for the galaxy is ripe for conquest and the restoration of the Necron Empire since the disappearance of the Old Ones more than 60 million Terran years ago. The Necrons are a completely robotic, humanoid species whose technological prowess is probably unmatched by any of the other intelligent species of the galaxy. Yet, out of a desire for vengeance against the more fortunate, long-lived ancient Xeno races called the Old Ones, and the trickery of the godlike intelligence known as the Satan, the Necrons shed their original organic forms and lost all forms of compassion and empathy, becoming ruthless, undying, killing machines who are determined to exert their mastery over the galaxy once more. They have lain dormant in their stasis crypts for millions of years. They have slumbered through the eons, waiting for the galaxy to heal from the wounds of a long and bloody war. Now, after 60 million years of dormancy, their great purpose begins. On desolate worlds thought long bereft of all life, ancient machineries wake into grim purpose, commencing the slow process of reviving themselves, freeing themselves from their tombs and striding across the stars once more. The unstoppable, the undying Necron Legions. All Necrons, from the lowliest of warriors to the most regal of lords, are driven by one ultimate goal to restore their ancient ruling dynasties to glory and to bring the galaxy under their rule once more, as it was in ancient days. Such was the edict long ago encoded into the Necrons' minds, and it is a command so fundamental to their being that it cannot be denied. Yet it is no small task, for the Necrons are awakening from their tomb worlds to find the galaxy of the late 41st millennium as recorded by the Imperial Calendar much changed. Many of the tomb worlds are no more, destroyed by cosmic disaster or alien invasion. Others are damaged, their entombed legions afflicted by slow madness or worn to dust by entropy's irresistible onset. There are even degenerate alien races that squat amongst the ruins of those Necron tomb worlds that remain, little aware of the greatness that they defile with their upstart presence. Yet there is no salvation to be found in such ignorance. The undying have come to reclaim their lands, and the living shall be swept aside. Yet, if billions of Necrons have been destroyed by the passage of eternity, countless billions more remain to see their dominion reborn. They are not creatures of flesh and blood, these Necrons, but android warriors whose immortal forms are forged from living metal. As such, they are almost impervious to destruction, and their mechanical bodies are swift to heal even the gravest wounds. Given time, Severed limbs reattach, armor plating re knits and shattered mechanical organs are rebuilt. The only way, then, to assure a Necron's destruction is to overwhelm its ability to self-repair, to inflict such massive damage that its ancient regenerative systems cannot keep pace. Even then, should irreparable damage occur, the Necron will often simply phase out. An automated Viridian teleportation beam returning it to the safety of the stasis crypts, where it remains in storage until such time as repairs can be carried out. The sciences by which such feats are achieved remain a mystery to outsiders, 
for the Necrons do not share their secrets with lesser races, and have set contingencies to prevent their supreme technologies from falling into the wrong hands. Should a fallen Necron warrior fail to phase out, it self-destructs and is consumed in a blaze of emerald light. Outwardly, this appears a little different to the glow of teleportation, leaving the foe to wonder whether the Necron has finally been destroyed or has merely retreated to its tomb. Victory of the Necrons is therefore always a tenuous thing, and a hard-won battle grants little surety of ultimate victory. For the Necron's defeats are minor inconveniences, the preludes to future triumphs, nothing more. Immortality has brought patience. The perils that the Necron survived in ancient times carry the lesson their race can overcome any opposition, if they have but the will to try. And if the Necrons possess only a single trait, it is that their will is unbending. Only one hope can now preserve the other intelligent races of the galaxy from the Necrons' advance. From the endless legions of silent and deathless warriors rising from long-forgotten tombs. If the Necrons can be prevented from waking to their full glory, if the scattered tomb worlds can be prevented from unifying, then there is a chance of survival. If not, then the great powers of the galaxy will surely fall and the Necrons shall rule supreme for all eternity, the undying and the endlessly cruel. Fact number one, the Necrons are a playable race in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. The Necrons are a robotic skeletal warrior race that has laid dormant in their stasis tombs for over six million Terran years and who are the soulless creation and former servants of the ancient Catan. Fact number two, as robots made of living metal, many Necron units possess the ability to reassemble themselves after being slain and continue to fight on. Fact number three, Necrons are known primarily for their trademark gauze and reanimation ability. Fact number four, traditionally Necrons possess the highest leadership across all units, but are extremely slow in melee, translating to slow initiative. Fact number five, the Necrons first appeared as a usable unit for the Warhammer 40,000 game as Necron Raiders, first published in White Dwarf issue 216 towards the end of the lifespan of the second edition of Warhammer 40k. Fact number six, at the time only Necron Warriors and Scarabs were given game rules and the Warriors were armed with gauze flare guns. A free Necron Warrior was included in issue number 217 of White Dwarf. Fact number 7, the first full-fledged Necron Army list was printed in the March 1999 issue of White Dwarf. It included an HQ choice of the Necron Lord, an elite choice of Necron Immortals, a troop choice of Necron Warriors, and two fast attacks, the Scarabs and Necron Destroyers. Fact number 8. The original scarabs were controlled individually and were not swarms on a single base as they are today. Fact number 9. The first Necron Codex was released in August of 2002 and added units such as the Flayed Ones, Wraiths, Heavy Destroyers, Necron Monoliths, and the Catan. Fact number 10. The first time the Imperium officially encountered the Necrons was during a battle between the Sisters of Battle and the Necrons, known as the Massacre of Sanctuary 101. Fact number 11. Before the race was known as Necrons, they were a humanoid species known as Necroteer. They were a morbid and short-lived people, plagued by illness that was linked to the high levels of radiation given off by their homeworld sun. Fact number 12, Necron Tyr began their existence in the far reaches of the galaxy known as the Halo Star System. Fact number 13, Necron Tyr cities were built in anticipation of their inevitable early demise, as the living were only brief residents, living in the shadows of their vast tombs of their ancestors. On their homeworld, the greatest monuments were built to the dead, never the living. Fact number 14, driven by necessity, the Necron Tyr escaped their homeworld and struck out for the stars, spreading their divided empire that was broken into different dynasties. 
Fact number 15, the Necron tier used their stasis crypts and slow moving antimatter powered torch ships in order to colonize distant worlds. Fact number 16, slowly the Necron tier dynasty spread. The rulers of the individual dynasties were themselves governed by the Triarch, a council composed of three pharaons. The head of the Triarch was known as the Silent King for he addressed his subjects only through the other two pharaons who ruled alongside him. Fact number 17, the short lifespan of the Necron tier ensured that the title of the Silent King passed from one royal dynasty to another many times. Fact number 18, the final days of the Necron tier empire occurred in the reign of Zarek, the last of the Silent Kings. Fact number 19, during their slow expansion the Necron tier encountered an ancient species far older than any other in existence in the known galaxy. They were known as the Old Ones, and they were absolute masters of the form of energy the Necron Tears could not even conceive of. This was psychic energy. Fact number 20. The Old Ones' colonization was immeasurably swifter and more expansive than the Necron Tear because of their creation of warp gates and mastery of the Immaterium. Fact number 21. The Necron Tear grew jealous of the Old Ones because of their control of psychic and warp technology and their refusal to share the secret of immortality. Fact number 22, as time passed, each dynasty of the Necron Tear sought to claim its own destiny and soon the great houses were engaged in all-out conflict known as the War of Secession. If this war would have continued, the Necron Tear would have wiped themselves off. Quickly, the Triarch, the ruling council of the Necrotir Empire, realized this and the only hope of unity lay in the conflict with an external enemy, the Old Ones. Fact number 23, the Triarch declared war on the Old Ones. At the same time, they offered amnesty to any secessionist dynasty who willingly returned to the fold. Thus lured by the spoils of victory and the promise of immortality, the separatist Necrotir realms abandoned their war of secession and the war in heaven began. Fact number 24, so strange and powerful were the weapons used by the Old Ones and the Necrontir that during the war it appeared as if the gods were fighting one another, earning the name the War in Heaven. Fact number 25, the Old Ones use of warp gates proved to be the perfect tool to outmaneuver the Necron Tier, pushing back the Necron Tier Empire to their halo star. They lay there exiled and forgotten for a millennia. Fact number 26, no longer did the prospect of a common enemy have any hold over the desperate dynasties. Scores of generations had lived and died in the service of an unwinnable war. This began the second iteration of the War of Secession more widespread and dangerous than the one that had come before. Fact number 27, many Necrontir dynasties would have gladly sued for peace with the Old Ones if the ruling Triarch had permitted it. Fact number 28, the Triarch searched desperately for a means of restoring order. At any point during this time, the Old Ones could have wiped out the Necrontir. They found what they were looking for when they had made contact with the godlike energy beings known as the Catan. Fact number 29, the Catan were little more than monstrous energy parasites that suckled upon the solar energies of the stars that had brought them into existence, shortening the lives of otherwise main sequence stars by millions of standard years. Beings of pure energy, they paid no mind to the hunks of solid matter they passed in the vacuum of space. They were like giant whales, ignoring the fish that passed them by. <laughs> Fact number 30, the dusty archives of the Tomb World of Solomons claim that Necron Tyr made contact with the Catan by accident, a chance discovery made by a stellar probe during the investigation of a dying star. Fact number 31, the Book of Mournful Night held under close guard in the Black Library's innermost sanctum tells rather that the raw hatred that the Necron Tear had for the Old Ones sang out across space, acting as a beacon that the Catan could not ignore. Fact number 32, another account claims that the Necron Tear scientists had been deeply engaged in stellar studies to try to understand and protect themselves from their own sun's energy. 
This led them to discover unusual electromagnetic anomalies in the oldest dying stars of the galaxies. They had discovered entities of pure energy. These entities had little conception of what the rest of the universe was like. The Necron tier introduced them to the universe. Fact number 33, Necron tiers called the entities Catan or star gods in their own tongue. They believed that the Catan were the embodiment of the death god they worshipped. Fact number 34, Necron Tyr actively sought the Catan's favor and oversaw the foregoing of physical shells for the Catan to occupy, cast from living metal called Necrodermis. Fact number 35, Elder Legends tell of the translucent streamers of electromagnetic forces shifting across space as the star vampires coiled into their new bodies. The Catan took the shape of the Necron tier half forgotten gods. Number 36. Once the Catan compressed their bodies into the Necrodermis, they began to focus their consciousness and become even more aware of their new existence. They came to appreciate the pleasures available to being of matter and other realities of the real world. Fact number 37. One of the Catans came before the Silent King, Zurich, acting as a forerunner to the coming of his brothers. Amongst its own kind, the Catan was known as the Deceiver, for it was willfully treacherous. It told of a war fought long before the birth of the Necron Tyr, between the Catan and the Old Ones. It was a war, he said, that the Catan lost. In the aftermath, and fearing the vengeance of the Old Ones, he and his brothers had hidden themselves away, hoping one day to find allies with whom they would finally bring the Old Ones to account. Fact number 38. The Deceiver asked that the Necron Tyr continue to wage the war in heaven, and in return the Catan would assure he and his brothers would deliver everything that the Necron Tyr craved. Unity could be theirs once again and immortality that they had sought for would finally be in their grasp. Fact number 39, the Catan's words held sway over Zurich, who like his ancestors before him despaired of the divisions that were tearing his people apart. For long months he debated the matter with the other two pharaons of the Triarch and the nobles of his royal court. Fact number 40, through it all, the only dissenting voice was that of Orican, the court astrologer, who foretold that the alliance between the Necron Tyr and the Catan would destroy forever the soul of the Necron Tyr people. Yet desire and ambition swiftly overrode cautious, as the Orican's prophecy was dismissed and the Pharaons accepted the Catan. Fact number one, the powers of the Catan were indeed almost godlike, and it was not long before the Catan were being worshipped as star gods by the Necron Tyr. Fact number two, the Catan gave the Necron Tyr weapons of godlike power and starships that could cross the galaxy in the blink of an eye, but the greatest gift that they gave was the path to immortality. Their diseased flesh would be replaced with the living metal of Necrodermis. With this, they were ready to continue the war in heaven. Fact number three, colossal cyclopean bio furnaces built by Necron Tyr roared day and night, and into these the Silent King's people marched according to the terms of the pact he made with the Catan. What blasphemous procedures the Necron Tyr were subjected to within these raging bio furnaces cannot be known, but certainly each was stripped of flesh and of soul, his body replaced by a shell of living metal, animated by what remained of his guttering self. Fact number four, above the furnaces swooped and dove the Catan as they indulged themselves on the life energy of an entire species, growing ever stronger. Fact number five, it was only when the Silent King himself emerged from the bio furnace and looked upon what had become of his people that he saw the awful truth of the pact he had made. His new machine body was far mightier than the frail form he had tolerated for so long. Yet there was an emptiness gnawing at his mind. In that moment, he knew with certainty that the prize of physical immortality had been the loss of his soul. The Necron Tyr race was gone. The Necron were born.
Fact number six. Every walk of life in the Necron tier society was biotransferred into the newly immortal bodies. Fact number seven. The biotransference process had enabled command protocol in every Necron mind, granting the Silent King the complete loyalty of his subjects. Fact number eight. Only a few of the most strong-willed Necron tier retained their intellect and self-awareness, and even they were but shadows of their former self. The very finest necrodermis bodies went to those individuals of the highest rank within the Necron tier society. For the professional soldier, the merely adequate was deemed appropriate. As for the common people, they received that which was remaining. Comparatively crude mechanical bodies that were little more than lobotomized prisons for their minds. Fact number 10. United and immortal, the Necrons set out into the galaxy in their tomb ships to complete their part of the deal made with the Catan. They attacked the Old Ones and every intelligent life in the galaxy. Fact number 11. The Old Ones' mastery of the warp was now countered by the Catan's supremacy over the physical universe. Whole star systems could be devoured by the black holes called into being by the reality warping powers of the star gods. Fact number 12, the deciding factor that won the war for the Necrons was their access to the Old Ones warp gates through a series of living stone portals known as Dolmen Gates. The Necrons were finally able to turn the Old Ones greatest weapons against them, vastly accelerating the ultimate end of the war in heaven. Fact number 13, it was the Catan known as Niadra Sath, the Burning One, who showed the Necrons how to find and use the Dolum Gates. He desired to carry his Eldric Fire into the space beyond space. Fact number 14. The webway can detect when it has been breached. Its arcane mechanism swiftly attempt to seal off the breach from the rest of the labyrinth of dimension until the danger to its integrity has passed. Fact number 15. The Dalam gates were neither so stable nor so controllable as the naturally occurring entrances to the webway. Necrons entering the webway had to reach their intended destination swiftly. Otherwise, the network itself brings about their destruction. Fact number 16. The Catan and their undying Necron servants now dominated the galaxy. The Necrons spread through the galaxy feeding on the souls of their captured. To the Catan, this time was known as the Red Harvest. Fact number 17, for an unknown reason, but probably because their individual hunger for mortal life energies knew no bound, the Catan ultimately began to fight amongst themselves for both sport and out of spite. They unleashed destructive forces beyond mortal comprehension. Fact number 18, as a last ditch attempt, the Old Ones genetically engineered intelligent beings with an even stronger psychic link to the warp hoping to create servants with the capability of channeling psychic powers to defend themselves from the Catan. Fact number 19. With the Old Ones psychically empowered servant races, the tides of the war in heaven changed and the Catan had to unify for the first time in a million years. They created a plan to forever defeat the psychic sorceries of the Old Ones by sealing off the material universe from the warp. Fact number 20. The work of the Catan to seal off the warp can be seen today in an area known as the Cadian Gate by the Imperium of Man. In the Imperial Fortress world of Cadia lies great pylons that litter the surface of the world in an intricate network and create the area of space known as the Eye of Terror. Back number 21. Before the Catan could finish their plan, the growing pains and collective psychic flaws of the younger races threw the untapped psychically reactive energies of the Immaterium into disorder. Older entities that had existed within the Immaterium transformed into terrifying psychic predators, tearing the souls of vulnerable psychers, and their own environment was torn apart and reforged into the realm of chaos. Fact number 22, the most terrifying of these horrors were the enslavers, warp entities whose ability to dominate the minds of the younger races and create their own portals into the material realm using transmuted possessed psychers brought them forth in greater numbers. Fact number 23, the horrors unleashed by the creation of the younger races finally scattered the last of the old ones and broke their power over the galaxy once and for all. Whether the species was extinct or simply fled the galaxy to seek a new haven elsewhere is unknown. The Necrons and the Catan were left to deal with the possessed younger races in the galaxy. Fact 
Number 24. With the old ones gone, the silent king, Zurich, found the perfect time to get vengeance over the Catan for taking his people's soul and revolted against his masters. Act number 25. The Catan were immortal star spawn therefore impossible to destroy. The Necrons instead smashed the Catan into smaller, less powerful fragments. Each Catan shard was bound within a multi-dimensional tesseract labyrinth. Fact number 26. Millions of Necrons had been destroyed as a consequence of the rebellion, including all of the members of the Triarch, but the Silent King remained. Fact number 27. After defeating the Catan, the Necrons weakened by their expenditure of lives and resources in overthrowing the rule of the Catan could not stand against the new young races known as the Eldar. So it was then that the Silent King ordered the remaining Necron cities to be transformed into great tomb complexes, threaded with stasis crypts. This was known as the Great Sleep. Fact number 28. It is unknown how many tomb worlds entered the Great Sleep. Fact number 29. The Silent King's final command to his people was that they must sleep for an equivalent of 60 million standard years but awake ready to rebuild all that they had lost. Fact number 30. Zurich destroyed the command protocols by which he had controlled his people for so long, for he had failed them utterly. Fact number 31. Zurich, the last of the Silent Kings of the Triarch, took a ship into the starless void of intergalactic space, there to find whatever measure of solace or penance he could find. Fact number 32. Millions if not billions of dormant Necrons were destroyed by unstable planets, supernova, stasis crypt failures, marauding Eldar, and inquisitive lifeforms. Fact number 33. Necrons began to rise 60 million years after their slumber. This time is the present and is known as the Great Awakening. Unfortunately for the Necrons, not every legion awakes at the same time. Billions of Necrons still slumber in their stasis tombs, silently awaiting the call of destiny. Fact number 34. It is rare for a tomb world to awaken to a full functioning swiftly. In most cases, these coalesce over time to restore identity and purpose, but it is a process that can take decades or even centuries and cannot be hurried. Sometimes, recovery never occurs and the sleeper is doomed to forever have a mindless state. Fact number 35. While dormant, each tomb world is controlled by the master artificial intelligence program that oversees its essential maintenance and defense, mobilizing what resources it judges appropriate to any given situation or threat. Fact number 36. A tomb world's defenses lies in the hands of the Necron robotic servitor construct. The Canoptic Spiders Scarabson wraiths all awaken by the master artificial intelligence depending on the severity of the tomb world's danger from invaders. Fact number 37. A tomb world is at its most vulnerable during the revivification process. The colossal amounts of energy generated are detectable across light years and are an irresistible lure to raiders. Fact number 38. The lower order of Necrons, the Necron warriors and immortals, are awakened in the initial phases. These nearly mindless beings follow their protocols so that they are prepared for the most senior members of the dynasty. Fact number 39. Each tier in the Necron dynasty's hierarchy is revived, each more intelligent and bearing more individuality than the last. The whole process gradually begins to appear more like the workings of an ancient civilization and less like that of some great machine. Fact number 40. A Necron Overlord is awakened and upon its full revival, the master program ceases power to its creator. From that point onward, the truly ancient minds lead the tomb world, and what happens next depends entirely upon the character and ambition of the Necron Overlord. When the Necron Lords are awakened, they find their full military might already mobilized and awaiting their command. The most famous one of these was the Tomb Worlds of the Saltek Dynasty. 
Some Necron Lords send diplomatic emissaries to other worlds, negotiating for the return of lost territories and technological artifacts, avoiding unnecessary conflict with other alien races. There are some Necron Lords that search for distant tomb worlds not yet awoken to build their last empire. The vast majority of tomb worlds take a more aggressive approach, launching resource raids, planetary invasions, or full-blown genocidal purges, because nothing says Warhammer 40k like planetary genocide. Each Necron dynasty is different in the way that it chooses to wage war. Some Necrons engage in honorable war, rigorously applying their ancient codes of battle, and others use every possible underhanded tactic, from piracy, deception, assassination, and even subordination. Because the Silent King is gone, each Tomb World's ruler must fend for himself, pursuing whatever course he deems suitable to the circumstance. The change from undying machine back to living being is the key motivation for many Necron nobles, for its possibility weighed heavily on the Silent King's mind at the moment of his final command. Because the Silent King left no clear secession, the rulers of many tomb worlds see an opportunity not only to restore their dynasties, but also to improve their standing within the galaxy-wide Necron political hierarchy. This has led to internal conflict within the dynasties. The Necrons are still a shadowy presence rather than a full-fledged force in the galaxy of the present time. They strike out of nowhere without warning, wrecking havoc and leaving before any major reinforcement can arrive. Necrons have touched down on Mars, simply passing by the Imperial Navy fleets protecting the Sol system unnoticed. They reached the red planet's surface and explored its subterranean Noctis Liberanthius. The Necrons were destroyed by the Imperium, but no Necron was captured. They all simply vanished using their phase technology. It is believed the Necrons were searching for one of their Catan masters, believed to be the entity known in the legends of the Adeptus Mechanicus as the Dragon of Mars. He is also known as the Void Dragon, which inhabits a stasis tomb beneath the sands of Mars. The Necrons have infiltrated the Imperium to a certain extent. Their elite anti psyker troop, the Pariah, are an unholy cross of human mutant and Necron technology. Recently, there has been a dramatic decrease in the use of the Necron Pariah in Necron armies. The Ordo Xenos believes that these troops may have not proven as effective as Necron commanders had once hoped, and are being phased out of the Necron dynasty's order of battle. The Eldar were tasked by the Old Ones to defend the galaxy from the Necrons, and so they took watch to any sign of Necron re-emergence. Unfortunately, after the Great Fall, the watch of the Necrons is a forgotten task. Only in the Black Library and amongst a few outspoken segments of Elder society did the vigilant community continue. The Yucatan system was a sparsely inhabited imperial system close to the eastern fringe and the site of the first naval encounter between the Necrons and the Imperial Navy. In the Yucatan system, a minor imperial fleet of six escort ships and a light cruiser were destroyed by Necrons, with the only survivor being a single Cobra-class destroyer. By the time a full Imperial fleet could be dispatched to the region to deal with what is now called the Yucatan Incident, the Necrons had disappeared and the system was found devoid of all human life. The unexplained event in the Yucatan system became the first fully documented Necron harvest and became known as a Yucatan Incident. During the self-imposed exile, the final Silent King of the Necron Triarch, Zurich encountered the Tyranids in the intergalactic void.
Zurich recognized if the Tyranids devoured all organic life in the galaxy, the Necrons will never find the living bodies to house their consciousness once more. It is rumored that the Silent King returned to the Milky Way galaxy to fight the Tyranids. The Silent King's plan was to raise his empire once again, but he did not anticipate on how much time had ruined so many tomb worlds. Working with the surviving Triarch Praetorians, he began a pilgrimage across the galaxy, steering those tomb worlds yet to be revived, and speeding the recovery of those tomb worlds already awoken. After High Fleet Behemoth was pushed back during the Battle of McCrag, the Inquisitor Helena Valeria traveled to the ghost world of Salamence. The Inquisitor was curious as to why this world was left untouched while the planets around were destroyed and consumed by the Tyranids. Nothing could have prepared Valeria for what she finds in the silent darkness beneath Solomon's pits and barren surface. Endless catacombs filled with highly advanced Sino technology, long lost artifacts from the Imperium's history, and gallery after gallery of intricate life-size holographic sculptures laid out to commemorate historical scenes. Valeria's party is then attacked by wave after wave of Canotep scarabs and Necron warriors. A ferocious battle of survival ensues, and the Inquisitor leads the defense and regains the initiative for her followers. The Necron defenses of the tomb world were led by the Necron Lord Trazin. Valeria unleashed a pulse from her Graviton Beamer that reduced the Necron Lord to a mangled and fused scrap. Yet moments later, an identical figure emerged from the darkness, completely undamaged. The Inquisitor managed to stab the Necron Lord with the Dagger of Midnight, which gave her and some of her followers enough time to escape while the Necron Lord took a while to reanimate into a working body. After the escape, Valeria received a personal hyperscroll message from Trazin himself thanking her for sending five regiments of Katachan jungle fighters to add to his gallery. The entire tomb world was a self-devolved museum. Accompanying the message as a return gift was a hyperstone maze, one of a series of Tesseract labyrinths constructed at the height of the dynasty. It is unknown what became of this gift thereafter. A minor tomb world called Samanor was under attack by the Eldar from Craftworld Aloitic. The Eldar were commanded by Farseer Eldrith Starbane. Starbane's campaign against the Necrons was pushed back by the reinforcement of Imotek the Stormlord and the forces of the Altec dynasty. Starbane was the only survivor of the Siege of Samanar and was sent back to his craft world with one hand amputated by Imotek as a reminder of his defeat. Samanor agreed to join the Sautek dynasty after the tomb world was saved. The newly awakened tomb world of Suranas was under attack by the orc Big Mech Ed Krampa. The great Wa is no match for the Necrons. Necron Lord Neptek manages to strike a deal with Ed Krumpa and forces his Wa to seek a different planet to attack in exchange for several dozen functioning Doomsday Cannons. Ed Krumpa agreed but knew that he would return several months later and destroy the Necrons anyways. Unfortunately for Ed Krumpa, his eagerness to tamper with the Doomsday Cannons proved to be fatal. As he approached the Imperial world of Eden Prime, the Big Mech breached the core containment drive of one of the cannons, causing a chain reaction that wiped out Ed Krumpa, his Wog, and the planet of Eden Prime. On an Imperial Hive world of Morigar, a battle between Hive gangs inadvertently awakens the Necron tomb hidden beneath the city. All contact with Morigar is lost after the encounter. Six months later, the Imperial Guard 207th Cadian Shock Troop Regiment finds no trace of any inhabitants, humans or otherwise.
Before the Imperial Guardsmen can leave Morogar, the nomadic Necron warlord, Anric the Traveler, arrives, assuming the humans are responsible for the apparent destruction of the tomb world, he launches an attack. The battle at the ruin of Morogar was so devastating that it left the Necron forces decimated and the Cadian 207th Regiment completely eliminated.